today is talk about how do you build support for you, from your board and community leaders and customers for the needs of your utility. And we're going to do that and discuss it by three main things, documentation, presentation, and communication. Those are the three main categories. We'll talk about each one for about an hour or so. We'll have some breaks in between. We're going to have a bonus section of what we call pros and cons for community buy-in. And we'll have a conclusion and wrap up hopefully around 12.30 and we'll eat lunch. Documentation. How do you record your system? How do you uh, keep that information for posterity and to prove to your customers and board that you do have needs that have to be addressed. Then once you have that documentation, how do you show your system needs best to them? Expose the problem. And lastly, communicate. How do you get that information out most effectively to the board and to your customers? With that being said, I'm going to turn the first section of this presentation over to Michael Harkness, who's going to talk about communication or documentation. Thanks, Pat. Good morning. I apologize for the uh, problems with the presentation. Uh, again, as Pat said, my name is Mike Harkness. I've been with Commonwealth for a little over a year. Um, I graduated from Manchester College and Purdue University in 1993. Getting old enough now, I can't remember those things. <clears throat> um, I was in the engineering field until 2004, then decided to get a crazy notion and go be a uh, full time fireman. So I do full time fireman. I just came off duty this morning actually, so I'm running on two hours of sleep. But if I start mumbling and not making sense, that's why. Um, and I work with uh, Commonwealth on my off days. This is one of the most important parts to me. Uh, for any utility is documentation. You need to document, document, document. One of the first questions I want to ask you, so we get right, stays away, stays involved. How many people have been involved with their utility for at least 15 years? Raise your hand. Uh, 20 years. 25 years. 30 years. 35 years. system runs, all your equipment, 
at your treatment plant, out in the system. Like I said, most of this is going to be for water. Um, you know, high surface pumps. How often do they run? What pressure do you run them at typically? How old are they? Is it documented? Same thing with your well field pumps. Um, also, some of you may recognize some of these uh, pictures as part of your equipment. So, um, and if you do, we thank you for letting us use them. Again, as far as like with your storage tanks, the age of the equipment, when's the last time it was inspected, painted? You know, do you know that? Do you have a document of what levels they run it? In your uh, within your system, um, anybody still use altitude valves with their storage tanks? You know, are they being calibrated? Oh, yeah. When's the last time they were calibrated? Okay, we'll just keep going here. <laughs> uh, next thing on the valves, you know, how many turns does it take to open and close them? Um, so I like just use me on hydrants. You know, what pressure do they run at? How, how much flow do they run? Uh, when's the last time you flushed them, especially dead end hydrants? You get the uh, help with your water quality. Uh, do you check them after use on a fire? If you have hydrants in your system, you need to make sure that, um, I know with us in Indianapolis, we always have to tell them what hydrants we use so that the Indianapolis Water Company can come out and check them to make sure that, yeah, you know, we're a student environment. So. We like to screw things up and you know, break things, so <clears throat> they always got to come out and make sure they're working okay. Valves, how many turns does it take to open and close them? Which direction do they do you need to go with them? What part of the system do they operate? If you have a breakage, do you know which hydrant or which valve you need to go to to turn that turn in that system off? You need to document it. You need to say, you know, so that somebody, like I said, somebody else can step in. There'll be a reoccurring theme here, as you can tell, documentation. Uh, different types of documentation we talk, like to talk about. I was just going over quality, quantity, age, and condition. Um, in your labs, how many, how many people do we have that do their own lab work? We're going to keep that nice and sugared up by the end of the day, so. <laughs> we'll keep you awake one way or another. Um, you know, you know how the age, you know, this is obviously a fairly new lab, but you need to know the age of your equipment in the lab, the maintenance. Um, like I said before, do you have it in your head? Is it on the computer, backed up and secure? Everybody's favorite form, the MRO form, complete reporting of operation. You have to do that obviously on a daily basis. Like I said, a lot of this is going to be generalized information. Some of this stuff that you already know. How many, how many people are still keeping it on the old paper form versus using the new computer form? Is everybody aware there is a form that you can do on the computer? Makes it a lot easier, I think, in the end. And then it's easy to transfer the information. And all you got to do is print it out at the end of the month and sign it. Next thing we want to talk about with documentation is the asset, aspects, I can't talk this morning, of the water. Uh, you need to understand and have it um, documented out there that your uh, sources, the water quality of your sources may differ. If you use different well fields, each one's going to be unique to itself. Um, you know the quality of the water within the system. Like we said, there's dead-end hydrants out there. That quality of water, if it's not pushed through, is going to change. You need to know how often you move that stuff out. Um, quality within your tanks and the chemical feed rates. One of the important things to remember, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So make sure you know if you have an incident, you can go back and take care of things. I know with us in the fire department, um, with injuries. If we didn't put it in the computer right away, or we delayed or we didn't put it in at all, and 
we had hurt our back on a EMS run. Coach is going to say, we don't see it, it didn't happen, we're not paying. So, like I said, make sure you document as much as you can. Next part of the uh, presentation I'm going to talk about is um, quantity information. What's involved in your quantity to be accounted, unaccounted for, water, metering, fire flows, hydrant flushing, and capacities. As far as accounted and unaccounted for water, everyone experiences it. Typically the industry standard is about 10 to 15 percent loss. Depends upon the number of users that you have. Also depends upon how big your system is. Um, this is a chart from one of our reports that we did for a client showing unaccounted for um, excuse me, water loss. Um, you can go, you can see one year he's got 35 percent water loss. The next year he's above by 15 percent. This is an example of spread out service area. You can't see it. Um, I know you can see it. Anyways, it's Candleford. Um, he's looking at about 48 square miles of service area. So he's got a lot of pipes spread out over a big area to serve um, not, not that many people, really. But I think he can experience some high levels of water loss. Whereas this is the town of um, Elwood. They're a compact service area with a higher number of users, so their water loss typically is a lot less. One of the most important things you can do is metering. And this goes for wastewater also, obviously. You need to meter every source so you can document where it's all coming from. As far as water, meter from your, your supply from your well fields, the water pumped to the system from the water treatment plant. Um, need, yeah, obviously, the big thing is you need to meter and build your usage, domestic, industrial, institutional, commercial, because obviously, in this day and age, you've got to make money some way or another. It's a very difficult thing to do for a lot of communities. They've got to find money everywhere they can find it now. Basic components of unaccounted for water include <clears throat> um, leakage, pipe breaks, meter, and, meter inaccuracy. Meters have a tendency as they age to slow down, therefore they will read slower, which means they're not reading the water going through, therefore you're losing money. So you need to try to get a program where you're doing maintenance on your meters, all your meters, water and wastewater. As you can see on the picture on the right, that's my dream as a fireman. I want to do that someday. With a, supply hose through a car. I had a chance a couple years ago on a carbon fire, but they wouldn't let me. I was very disappointed in that. Um, other unaccounted for water, which is beneficial to the system, is backwashing at your treatment plants, um, hydro flushing, and fire flow. But you can also meter your hydro flushing, obviously. It's kind of hard to do the fire flow uh, when the hydrant's being used, but you can meter your hydro flushing. What happens with unaccounted for water? Obviously, it increases your revenue, which is probably the biggest thing now. Increasing your system capacity, and then it increases your wear of your equipment because you're, have, you're thinking you have to push more water through. And obviously, a lot of that um, money, as you can see, would be going down the drain. Like we said before, all sources should be metered well fields, water treatment plant, customers. These are pictures of different types of meters. Um, one of the newer systems that we're looking at that some, anybody out here have um, automated meters? They can, anybody else have automated? Yeah. It's 
So uh, is everybody familiar with automated meters? Do they know what? Yeah. You, mean, what you mean radio? Mm -hmm. You mean the ones with radio read? Yeah, or you have a handheld device. I'll show it here. Hopefully it comes up. Like you gotta have a handheld device. You can walk or drive um, by meters. It's obviously a lot more efficient way of getting the system and then you download after you've read the meters onto a computer. Next are, um, we talk about fire flows or hydrants. Um, typically, minimum, you want a hydrant of six inch water mains. Uh, if you have hydrants in your system, this obviously reduces your property insurance and um, you need the capacity to uh, flow to the proper uh, supply. The picture I s you see in there, that, I don't know if you remember a couple years ago, that was the big um, fire in downtown Indianapolis on the canal. Um, the apartment building, um, apartment building burned down. That's as you was the picture. <clears throat> Capacity needs vary. Um, a lot of it will depend on your construction materials, size of the building, occupancy. Adjacent structures, and then um, in the case for me as a fireman, say you buy a rear end. I've had, I've had some situations where I've gone in, I just actually just a few weeks ago, um, we had a kitchen fire. I was sitting in there by myself on the hand line and watching the fire going over my head and the water, waiting for water, waiting for water. Finally got it, I was able to get it out, but I was starting to be able to work because the fire was getting behind me. This is an example, um, if you want to look at it closer, of uh, fire flow forms. I apologize to you, I know it's hard, and it, this is going out, so it's hard for you to see what we're doing here. That you can utilize when you test your hydrants or flow them. Uh, like we said, uh, another reason for hydrant flushing, quality issue, dead end mains. Uh, typically they're based on 20 PSI residual. You need to take into consideration the public when you're testing and flushing. And then operation of hydrants in cold weather. Um, I was on a fire a few years ago. We just about had it out and it was really cold weather and my hose went limp. Um, it took another 10 minutes, 15 minutes to get the hydrant, because the initial hydrant they hooked to was frozen. They had to find another hydrant that worked. By the time they had it hooked up again, we were backed out and had to start over. Ended up losing half the building when we could have held it to one unit. So you got to make sure your hydrants are working correctly, especially in cold weather for your firemen. Capacities, document capacities of your pumps, your tanks. Your well fields and your treatment plant equipment. Know how all that runs. Know how it, um, uh, how much you can put out with each piece of equipment. Age information. How old is your equipment? Typically, most equipment, treatment plant, water, wastewater. Second, see of 20 to 30 years. Know when it was put in, how much, how long is it going to last? Um, make sure you have your own end manuals handy, especially like I said before, if you are out of town and something goes on, the person that takes your place can step in there, knows where they're at, can utilize those to help them um, maintain the equipment and use it. Pipe materials. How long has those been in? Document where you start, where you get breakages on in your system. You know, different pipe materials obviously last different length of time. And as I said before, you want to keep um, good tabs of breakages. You know where, what, what uh, valves can turn off certain systems. <clears throat> Should there be a water main break? You know, document the locations on the map. Um, how many, uh, 
this, if you're in a bigger system, it's obviously going to be running with higher pressure. You should, if you have a water main break, is this going to create major property damage? Do you need to get out there right away to get it turned off? Or in our smaller system, lower pressures, typical 60 psi, 70 psi, where it can run out, and if it's gradually running out, where you can maybe take a day or two before you get out there and crew to fix it. And then, like I said before, you know, do you maintain your maintenance logs and your repair logs. And with that. I'm going to turn it over to Steve Bender. A uh, little background information on me. I've been with Commonwealth, well, I can't say I've been with. I started with Commonwealth in 1976, 35 years ago. I did have a brief period there where I kind of thought maybe I'd like to be with a smaller firm. So uh, I worked for a few years, and then I realized I missed the resources and the assets of a larger firm. So I came back to Commonwealth, and Tend to tend to finish my career there. But um, I know we've lost a little time already, so forgive me if I don't follow the, the, uh, uh, the guideline that we have there. Uh, I may ask Kyle to get through some of these slides in the interest of getting to his presentation, which is going to be regarding CUPS, which is Checkup Program for Small Systems, I believe. Anybody familiar with that or anybody actually using it? That's free public domain software from the EPA. And uh, it's very, very useful in several aspects of OEM, which is what I'm going to talk about. Um, how many of you actually have perhaps a, a, a website with perhaps a link to your, to your utility? Any, any of you actually do that? Um, I think it's very, very useful. And in fact, uh, it's useful for the public, it's use, useful for town officials, it's useful for uh, town employees. Um, you know, it's the nature of our political and our electoral system. Oftentimes, town officials come and go, just as utility employees come and go. It's very, very useful to document everything regarding the operation of your public water supply system. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about reports and repair logs, maintenance records. Uh, the other thing, when, when, I, when we talk about O&M, I look at it from two different viewpoints. Uh, one is from yours as a utility manager and utility operator. And one is from an engineering perspective. Obviously, if you're doing operation maintenance, you're concerned about the work that you are doing in-house with you and your own staff. Um, then you, uh, a second aspect of that is work that you would actually do through a, a service provider or through a maintenance contract. I'm sure most of you probably utilize those, especially for large equipment items like high service pumps, wells, uh, chemical feed systems, elevated storage tanks, things of that nature. Flip. Uh, as I said, document everything to do with your public water supply, your raw water supply sources, your well information. You, you should include information regarding the depth of your well, the diameter of the, uh, the diameter length of the screen, the depth of the pump set. Um, for all your plant processes, you should have detailed information, most of which is going to be provided by, uh, by the manufacturer. Um, distribution system mapping, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, emergency interconnections. I think this is a very, very good idea, and it's something that IDEM is really pushing nowadays, especially for communities that may lie within about 10 miles or so of each other. Um, mutual aid agreements. If you have one where the water is flowing either direction, uh, there's a lot more to it than just running a pipe and putting a valve in the middle. Um, you know, there probably are different hydraulic characteristics for each system. You may have to pump in one direction, you may have to provide flow regulation going the other direction. So, uh, you know, if you have a situation where you could be looking at a mutual aid agreement with another utility, uh, and you want to look at the engineering aspect, um, talk to your engineer. If you're not working with an engineer, a little plug for us. Uh, one of us would love to feel a call on, on that kind of situation. Next. Um, equipment records, this is the type of information you should have ready access to. Manufacturer's name, models and serial numbers for all equipment, installation date Mike touched upon, uh, quick access to the, uh, the manufacturer's rep and to the maintenance, uh, your maintenance contractor. One of the things I'd like to point out, if you have a, an equipment item that you're not sure exactly how to best operate and maintain, Always feel free to call the manufacturer's rep, and if you're not getting your answers there, go straight to the manufacturer. 
uh, they're often very, very useful in, in giving the information you need. And in fact, if it's not an urgent situation, something you can wait on, uh, tell them you'd like to have someone stop by if they happen to be in the area. And the chances are they can make a service call for you at no, no cost, little or no cost to you. When you're developing a maintenance plan, these are the things uh, uh, a utility operator or a water superintendent should uh, always make sure his staff is aware of it. Make sure he has the tools of the trade, basically. And identify the specific work to be done, identify who has performed the work, and, and have a form that shows a recommended frequency for that work. You should have dates of when it was last done and when, when it's to next be performed. Um, next. This is just a simple, like, finally, some graphics. Uh, a sample form that you might have, and this isn't inclusive by any means, but um, uh, first identify the category. It may be supply, then treatment, then distribution, then storage. And identify um, within each category specifically what item needs, needs maintenance activity. And then identify the frequency, whether it's daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, annually, biannually. Um, Record when that service was performed, who did the service, and when the next scheduled service date is. Uh, again, tools of the trade. This is the information that anyone who is an employee of your utility that you expect to perform work, these are the items they need to have. Uh, manufacturers own in instructions, and that stuff typically, you know, we're in a digital age now. And a lot of equipment providers are providing this stuff on CDs or in, in digital form. Um, I like that idea. I believe in the Reduction in Paperwork Act. I think it's very nice to keep as much as you can on your computer. And Kyle will go through that in a little more detail when he talks about Kyle. Um, next. <clears throat> you know, you walk into any water treatment plant, you're going to see a number of items that are going to re require routine maintenance and inspection. Uh, this particular plant has a few unique items you may not have. This operates at a very high discharge end. So we've got several control valves in here with pilots on that are going to need routine inspection maintenance. Uh, just look around, pumps, motors, these are vertical turbine, 150 horsepower of high service pumps. Obviously that's something you're going to use a maintenance contract for. Uh, piping itself, manual valves, uh, pneumatic actuators on filter function control valves, chart recorders, all sorts of things that would require routine and regular inspection. Um, as I mentioned, you probably have a lot of work done by uh, an outside maintenance contractor. This is an example of a report that's actually done by Peerless Midwest for a water treatment plant up in the city of Plymouth, Indiana. Uh, this is a great form. I like everything that's in here. A lot of information on test results information on the condition of various items. Uh, my only argument with this farm, as far as date, all it includes is a year. I would like to at least have a month and a year that maintenance work was performed. Um, distribution system operation. Uh, we think it's not only is mapping a good idea, it's a very good idea to actually document <coughs> this type of information for every value you have in your system. Location, type of valve, butterfly gate, make of valve, size of valve. Most of you know, record the number of turns. I, most of you know a gate valve, three times the valve size plus one is the number of turns to operate, uh, open or close a valve. So uh, 31 turns, 10 inch gate valve. Um, date installed, date exercise, does it operate properly? Record what surface material it is in. Oftentimes, street department's going to have a paving contractor come in and you know, I've seen a lot of valves get paid right over. Uh, you want to make sure that you interact with the street department when you're having that kind of work done. Valve status open and closed, and the condition of the valve box, you want to, you know, make note if there's debris in the valve box and something that you need to address. Uh, I threw this in here because I'm, I'm sure you guys are mostly aware of some of the devices that are out there. It's a, you got to tell one of your workers is going to go out and exercise 100 or 200 valves, and uh, he's going to say, well, I'm going to be the one getting the exercise. Um, you know, they make truck and trailer mounted valve operators nowadays. Um, these manufacturers have been very, very innovative. Um, 
some of these actually come with pressure washers and that, that sort of thing. So you, there's an opportunity to get multi-use out of it. Next. I, re I even recommend keeping records of dead end uh, flushing when you're performing that in your system, if you have a lot of them, especially. Uh, record location, the data was done, water char characteristics both before and after the flushing. Uh, if you have a simple portable test kit, it's a good idea to uh, check the chlorine residual in those dead ends. Um, obviously, I wouldn't test the very first slug of water coming out of there. If it's extremely dirty or rusty, it's probably not going to have a chlorine residual, and it's probably really not representative of what's going on in the line at that point. So let that first slug go and then collect a sample. Next. <coughs> Planning for emergencies, let's go. <coughs> um, emergency re response plans. I probably should have had wellhead protection up first because I came before ERP. Uh, this is kind of a sister program to wellhead protection, uh, kind of uh, in response to what happened on 9-11. But uh, just some of the activities and things you can do whenever you're responding to an emergency. First things first, protect yourself. Then make, make sure you take an action to protect the public. If you have a situation where you lose pressure in your system, get a boy order out, notify the press, notify IDEM, uh, make repairs on a pri priority demand basis, and try to return the system to normal operation as quickly as possible. Uh, a sample for an emergency response is a spill. I put this in there, I thought this one was a little cute. We have a, real, a derailment up here on the top slide somebody who apparently, would you say it's a class A hazard suit here, uh, fully enclosed, self-contained breathing apparatus, and a posture which shows he's obviously a little overwhelmed with the task at hand. <laughs> but a, a spill could also be something very simple as maybe a 55-gallon drum or something being dumped into a local uh, drainage way. Uh, you need to, first of all, again, take care of yourself. Protect yourself first. If you don't know what it is, Collect a sample if possible, but only do it if you don't have to touch it, don't have to breathe it, you don't know what it might be. Um, describe the affected area, estimate the amount spilled, estimate the amount that has been recovered, and, uh, and then get, to, get into cleanup activities, especially probably in situations like these after we call in, call in a notifying item. I'm sure most of you probably have ready access to the emergency response section at item, but that's phone number. Next. Wellhead protection. I'm sure most of you know what a delineation looks like. Most of them have a one and five year time of travel. That's what we have here. Red is one year. Um, the other one is five year, obviously. Most streams in Indiana, the groundwater direction is toward the water body. Uh, that's the Wabash River. This is actually Terre Haute. <coughs> Indiana American Water Corporation, which serves Terre Haute. Um, that's why your delineation is actually elongated toward the river. Um, these don't have to be done on aerial photos. It's nice because it gives you a quick reference. Go to the next one. They can be quite simple as long as you show your major roadways. Uh, obviously have a graphic scale. Identify the well field or the well heads. Identify the potential contaminant sources. This is all we'll have to you. So the important thing is whenever you do a modification to your system, whether it's adding a well, adding, adding a adding a tank or something, that would probably affect your emergency response plan. It may also affect your wellhead protection plan. So the important thing I'm trying to get across is to keep those documents up to date. And that's something we do a lot of in our office. Um, I write consumer conference reports. We write wellhead protection plans, emergency response plans, all those sorts of things. Uh, if you don't have uh, someone to assist you with something like that, again, we'd be happy to field a call on that. Next. This is simply public information. This is something you can pass out in a handout to your public or possibly even post at a town hall. Just give the public simple ideas on how to protect the groundwater. Uh, I remember once when I first started working at Commonwealth, this is 35 years ago, I had moved to Indianapolis and I was, I guess, out partying with friends. I was still a fairly young man. <laughs> and I had come home and I noticed a guy was changing his oil. I had gone up into my Apartment and realized that I left something in my car. I want to come back, and, and there he was dumping the oil down a storm drain. 
you know, if you see that kind of activity, it needs to be reported. 35 years ago, not a big deal. He probably would have just been slapped on the hand. Nowadays, he might even be prosecuted. Next. Uh, discussion about consumer confidence reports. Um, you know, when the, when the uh, Safe Drinking Water Act was first uh, developed, I think there were probably 65 or 70 contaminants. I think now it's up to around 115 or so. These are the various categories of items that are, are, that are actually uh, 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 regulated by EPA and your local state authority. Um, having done a lot of consumer confidence reports myself, I see one that's popping up is diethyl hexyl phthalate. And uh, typically they're not above an MCL, but when you're doing an MCL, next slide. <coughs> oh, well, I'll get a little ahead of myself. Go ahead, go ahead, next uh, Not only, oh, when we talk about CCRs, uh, you're probably aware they're due by July 1st of every year. So uh, we have, what, two days. So uh, it's probably too late to ask me for help. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, your information for two, 2010 is due by July 1st of this year, a couple of days from now. IDEM keeps a record on a statewide level. I thought an interesting uh, statistic on here as far as, uh, uh, and, and they keep records not only by MCLs and categories of contaminants, they keep records whether you have a violation regarding uh, reporting and monitoring, treatment technique, uh, and actually submitting that report to your customers. Um, if you look at the community public water supplies in the bottom, we had a total of uh, 1,179 violations among 162 community pu uh, public water supply systems. I wasn't expecting that number to be that large. Just to give you an idea, there are roughly 4,300 public water supplies in Indiana. About 65% of those are actually community-based. Um, uh, the rest, I think about 15 are non-transient, about Am I adding that up right? 20, 25% or so are, not, are transient non-community. I mentioned that already. Most of you know the concept of MCL, maximum contaminant level. SRL I know is used a lot nationwide, but I don't think it's used much in Indiana. That's the state reporting level for any regulated contaminant. MDL, when it was originally developed by EPA, actually stood for method detection limit. Uh, meaning the lower level that can be detected using any particular laboratory type technique. That's kind of evolved over the years to stand for a minimum detection level. So uh, anything, even if you're not exceeding an MCL, anything, any regulated contaminant that is detected above the MDL has to be reported on your CCR, even if it's not a violation. A couple of resources, IDEM has a website uh, which contains uh, CCR data, or at least everything that is actually reported to them by the various laboratories. Um, that link is a little hard to get to, but if any of you are interested and would like to have it, I have a link on my computer at the office. Feel free to call us, I can tell you how to get there. Another resource is uh, CCR iWriter by EPA, more public domain software. Um, that's actually a template or format for you to develop a CCR on your own and not have some independent consultant doing that for you. Talk about water mapping a little bit. Mike talked about it. You gotta have this stuff on paper. A lot of times you go into it, you tell you, well, we, so-and-so knew where everything was, but he's, he's no longer with us. <clears throat> um, go ahead to the next slide. Uh, we like to do these using AutoCAD, uh, most common engineering software out there for, for CAD types. This is, uh, this is one that was done for the city of Napanee. This is actually an overall kind of an index map for the whole community. I think Napanee covers, what, maybe six or eight square miles, something like that. Um, we have an index map and then we have 29 sheets. Go to the next slide. I know it's hard to see, but uh, what the town does is they'll take these maps, print, print them out on 11 by 17, assemble them in a booklet, and you have quick and ready access to any information out in your system, where the valves are, where the hydrants are, what the water main sizes are, things of that nature. Some people actually take this much farther. They'll actually show individual parcels on here. They'll actually show tap 
locations if they have it, and they'll show meter locations and that sort of thing. But something like this we feel is really a minimum that any utility should have for a system. Uh, we're, again, we're in the digital age. A lot of times when we uh, start working on a project with the community, we ask for any existing documentation they have. We want to have asphalt drawings, any, any design drawings they may have. Um, oftentimes when they get to us or they show them to us, they're literally falling apart because they're 30, 40, 50 years old. Um, most of your engineering consultants will have large scanners, and we do. This is service we're happy to provide. We always scan those things. We put that information on a CD, give it back to the client, tape up their originals, give them a hard copy as well, so they've got a lot more than they originally gave us. Uh, that's another service that we provide. And this is just an example of the same thing done on a sewer utility, an example of a plan and profile for a, a sewer line. We're looking to give you ideas and prompts on what you need to be documenting so that in the future, when something bad does go happen within your system, you have the documentation to say, I've been doing maintenance, here's what has been done, and here's what we got to this point. We, to the piece of equipment that's 35 years old, only expected to have a 30 year life. We've got five more years out of it than expected. Now's the time we've got to do something, a capital project or a big maintenance pro project to replace that piece of equipment. It gives you the documentation to go before your board and, and show them that you've been doing your job, that now they're going to have to agree to the extra cost of replacing that piece of equipment. 